Uh, what order is this? That's Doric. This is the lowest order, the Tuscan order. The Tuscan order, which looks a lot like the Doric, but it's the Tuscan order. Then you got the Doric, this here with your sort of ears. Ionic, good, good. You learned something in high school. Uh, Corinthian, composite, the composite order. These are the five orders. I'm not going to go through all the books. We could be here for several days going through his different books. Uh, the other way that he learned architecture, another way that he learned architecture, uh, was through building. Uh, he was intimately involved in the construction up at Monticello. Yes, there were enslaved African Americans, and there were free, and there were whites that worked for him and did all the different work, whether it is making bricks, as we have right here. This is a brick maker. These are some of the wood tools and so forth. Jefferson knew all of this stuff. There is a rather wonderful story that dates to 1822 and to the construction going on here at the university when a young newspaper reporter from Vermont came down to see what was going on here in Charlottesville. And he goes up to what is today the lawn, uh, and the work is going on and so forth. And there is this old man wandering around, and he comes up to one of the stone cutters, and he grabs the chisel and the hammer out of his hand and says, you're not doing it right. It turns out it was Jefferson, and he begins hammering away. Uh, so this is a guy who is very, very much involved and knows all of that. The other way that he learns architecture is through travel. As I've already mentioned, uh, his time in Europe is very, very important. The five years that he spends in, in France, uh, but also traveling in Italy, throughout uh, France, <coughs> excuse me, England, uh, and the Low Countries. Uh, here is an example of that trip and so forth. While he is in Paris, he gets a letter. He had already been governor of Virginia, and he was the guy that shifted the Virginia state capital from Richmond, um, excuse me, from Williamsburg up to Richmond. Uh, he gets a letter uh, from uh, some of the legislators saying, could you send us back some plans for the new state capital, the new state house building? He does send them back, uh, and this is it here on the left. Uh, on the right, this is what it's based on, the Maison Carré, which is a temple. Uh, down in the southern part of France, which actually he did go and visit, uh, and he copies portions of that, uh, portions of that for this building. Uh, the Virginia State Capitol is not his best building. His best is right across the street. But this is arguably his most important, because this is the first public building built in this country after the Revolution. And it sets in motion an identification of American public architecture with the architecture of the ancients, with Rome, with Greece. Uh, and as I say, this is a state building. But this is the building that really kicks in. Uh, and of course, Jefferson will come back to this country from France, becomes the Secretary of State in the Washington administration. Uh, here we are. Uh, as Secretary of State in those years, it's not the same thing as the Secretary of State today, which is, is just simply foreign affairs. It was actually internal affairs. There are only five cabinet officers in Washington's administration. Uh, and he was responsible for, really, the setting up of Washington, D.C., which, if you're not familiar, is a new town, a totally new town that was designed and built at that point in time. And this is Jefferson's plan for it right here. We don't need to go into that. Uh, this is uh, Pat Reynolds. He's a cartoonist with the Washington Post uh, who does historical cartoons. The guy with the red hair here, this is Jefferson right there. Uh, this is a typical sort of, this is, once you get politicians involved in architecture, you can have a lot of problems and so forth. Uh, and in this case here, this is over the competition for the United States Capitol. Uh, and how it was decided, and of course it was a typical mess. Um, but Jefferson wanted to avoid it, uh, but it did, uh, but it did, it did happen. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest here is that by the time that Jefferson gets involved with the design of the University of Virginia, he has, knows a lot about architecture, and he's done a lot of different things. Not only just his own house, Monticello, uh, but Poplar Forest, which is down here at the bottom, uh, which is his getaway house uh, down uh, just outside of Lynchburg, uh, scattered around here in the Piedmont, and there's a lot of debate on a lot of these things, but there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 16 different houses of friends that he contributes uh, designs to and so forth, Farmington, 
uh, uh, right here, the country club that's a little bit outside of town. Uh, a lot of other things. Uh, he designed three Virginia courthouses. This is the only one that survives. This is down on the south of the James River on south side Virginia, uh, Charlotte County Courthouse. Uh, and this is very, very important because he helps to set in motion another identification of a Virginia, co uh, Virginia courthouses with this sort of templed, uh, uh, with this templed type of facade. Okay, turning to the University of Virginia. All architecture, as all art, is in some sense autobiographical, in the sense that that poem that you are maybe struggling to write, or that novel, or that painting, does have something of you personal in it. Now, it depends, of course, of how much it is. But architecture is the same way. It does have different elements of you in it. And what we have at the University of Virginia is, in a sense, his reaction to his collegiate education. Because he attended the College of William and Mary down in uh, Williamsburg. Uh, the College of William and Mary was at that point in time basically one large building within two subsidiary buildings. This for the School for the Indians. This is the President's House. This is it reconstructed right here. This is the main building. Uh, it was at that point in time, how many of you have been there? Well, go there. Go to Williamsburg. It is one of uh, another one of these great, uh, uh, great things. But this is where he spent two years, and then he spent other years, many other years in Williamsburg, uh, studying law, and then becoming a, a state legislator uh, or a col colonial legislator, and then ultimately become, becoming governor. Uh, but this building right here, known as the Wren Building, is where all of the forty odd young white males lived, slept, ate, and took their classes, and where six of the seven professors lived as well. College of William & Mary at that time was an Anglican institution, or Episcopalian, we would call it today. Uh, all institutions of higher learning in this country, really up to the Civil War, had religious types of affiliations, with one exception here. But every place had that. And indeed, most professors at most institutions of higher learning up to the Civil War were men of the cloth. They had some sort of a religious type of background. That is just simply part, that's a broad generalization, that's simply part of American, uh, of American history. As I say, it is in this place where the 40-odd young white males lived with their professors. Uh, descriptions of life there uh, are like Animal House uh, or Rugby Road on a Friday or Saturday night. And I assume you all have some familiarity with that. Uh, in other words, it was one of the professors, a man of the cloth, like nothing better than getting the young boys a little charged up and going in raids against the townspeople. Good town gown relations. Uh, Okay, think of this. One big building, everybody crammed in there. Then think across the street. Do you get where I'm going? This is a very different thing. In other words, he is reacting to what he saw here. And in the ensuing years leading up to the University of Virginia, he's down here in the 1760s. The University of Virginia doesn't begin until 1814. There are a number of letters where people are writing him from Ohio, from Tennessee, you name it, and saying, you know, dear Mr. Jefferson, we are thinking about starting a school or something like that. What does he write back? Avoid a single large building. It is injurious to the health. Much better to have a sequence of pavilions for the professors, rooms for the students, all connected together by a covered walkway. As to say, this is something that is, that, is, that, that is there. So anyway, to fast forward on this, uh, actually while Jefferson was uh, governor in, in 1779, he does make a proposal to the state legislature uh, that, uh, and this is right in the middle of the revolution, when the Brits are still rampaging around and so forth and burning things right and left, 
he makes a proposal to the state legislature that the state ought to take on the education of the populace, that we can't have a republic or a democracy unless you have an educated citizenry. And he suggests a primary level, a secondary level, and then a collegiate level. This is 1779. Look at the confidence that he has here at the same time as they say that we're still in the middle of the revolution. But he gets this reputation as a sort of education president. And that's one of the reasons why all of these different letters and so forth, all these different letters and so forth are coming to him. Well, in any event, and I should say, he makes the proposal to the state legislature. And the state legislature then is not any different than the state legislature today. They did nothing. I mean, that's typical of Unfortunately, sorry, but <laughs> don't repeat that down. Well, <laughs> anyway, but there is a certain similarity between this. Uh, but in any event, uh, we fast forward um, to 1814. Uh, Jefferson has been out of the presidency by that period for f five years. He was president from 1801 to 1809. He's back down here fiddling around up at Monticello uh, with Poplar Forest and so forth, but also looking for something to do. And a group of young men, one of which was a nephew of his, had come up with the idea of creating a school here in Charlottesville to be known as the Albemarle Academy. And they hadn't gotten very far with it, but they were having meetings and so forth. And one day, and it was in an April 1814, they were meeting down at the Old Stone Tavern which no longer stands, but was on Market Street. There is a historical sign there on Market Street in downtown Charlottesville. And they were in there meeting. Uh, and one of them looked up and saw in the window going past Jefferson riding. So, hey, hey, come in here. Comes in, and he takes it over, of course. This is Mr. Control. He takes over the thing. Now, there is some suspicion in a couple of our parts that this is maybe a little bit of a setup and so forth. But in any event, he comes in and he takes over this group. Uh, and in the next couple of months, and we're not quite sure of the dates on this. Uh, I've dated this to August, but it could be any couple of months in there. Uh, he does a preliminary plan for the Albemarle Academy. Uh, and if you notice this right here, okay, see, here it is over here. This is two sides of the same sheet of paper. And this goes back to another issue here about drawings and so forth. Paper was a much more expensive commodity in those days than it is now. Uh, and uh, so your tendency was not to waste paper and so forth. So this is done on both sides. And what he's done right here, these are sort of this, uh, 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 some of the working out of, of some of the uh, dimensions and so forth, and possibilities of cost and all this. But what we're particularly interested in is this right here. Because you can see what this is. This is a large U-shaped scheme with nine pavilions right here, which will be classrooms and a place for the teacher to live. Uh, in between, you have these little sort of cells, and this is where the students would be. And then if you can see here, there's sort of a line going around. This is a covered walkway. Behind this are the gardens. What is interesting, written in the center of this is 257 yards. 257 yards. And if you read this over here, what he's talking about is basically from there to there and from there to there, uh, open-ended, but it's basically a sort of a square, 257 yards by 257 yards. <clears throat> 